That was a nice introduction. Um, thank you guys for letting me come here and share with you kind of what I know um, about marijuana and kind of a little story of how I really got into this, um, not as a career choice or very, you know, it's not really where I wanted to be, but as a practicing pain medicine physician, I was seeing a lot of patients coming into my office that were on an exorbitant amount of opioids, which is a whole other discussion because we have a national opioid crisis epidemic at this point. And they were reporting very high levels of pain, and they were using marijuana for pain control. And so that makes really no clinical sense to me why you would have high levels of pain and taking these drugs and you know, smoking, eating, baking, different uh, components of the plant. It doesn't seem to be working. So I did a lot of reading. I educated myself on uh, the endocannabinoid system, which I'll talk about a little bit. And I got myself onto the governor's task force in Colorado when they legalized it uh, because I felt the physician community should have a voice on this. And, 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 and I believe in research and study and scientific evidence and evidence-based medicine. And so that's how I ended up on the state's Medical Marijuana Scientific Advisory Council where we awarded $9 million in actually marijuana money uh, to do some scientific research. So if anybody in academia has ever reviewed an RFP, does that ring a bell to anybody? Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Lots of, we had, I think we had 85 RFPs, all of which were like 100 plus pages long. We whittled it down to nine studies that we awarded. Uh, so I'm going to get going. There's a lot of information that I'm trying to cover in a very short amount of time, so I apologize if I go super fast, but I, I think it's very important that uh, you guys really understand what's happening in Colorado because I think there's a lot of misinformation getting out there on, on how much money we're making, and, and um, it's been wonderful, and, and patients are doing great, etc. And I'm going to try to clarify some of these issues. So this is just a picture of an illegal marijuana grow somewhere in the forest in Colorado because it's becoming an environmental issue that I don't have time to really cover today. All right, so I'll try to get back on track here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about marijuana in general. Uh, there's different kinds of plants. We are familiar with just uh, cannabis sativa, which is the most common, uh, commonly used cannabis product, and the cannabis indica. And there's a lot of things that can be isolated from the plant, different chemicals. Uh, there's actually many dozens of psychoactive components of the plant. The ones that we're most familiar with is the THC, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that's the primary psychoactive component of the plant. Uh, the leaves are different. The, the, plant, the, the plants themselves are different. And when I talk a little bit about some of the law enforcement issues, these are not little orchids that are in the window. These are, these are trees where when they eradicate the illegal groves, they have to bring in chainsaws to cut them down. Um, you know, there's, I wish they wouldn't call it the endocannabinoid system. I personally have an issue with that because the, cannabis is not a naturally occurring um, chemical in our bodies. I mean, the, the anandamide uh, is probably the one I would lean more towards because that's a naturally occurring cannabinoid in our system, kind of like the endorphins uh, with the natural running high, etc. But there's a, it's pretty fairly well studied where we understand how it is generated via uh, you know, physiologic activity. And the THCA, pay attention to that because it, I'm going to follow up with that later regarding a patient that I have um, that I'll discuss later about THC is kind of a pro drug that is metabolized through decarboxylation to THC in the system. Uh, so I'm not going to get into all the science and mumbo jumbo of of the endocannabinoid system, but it's very important that you are aware that it is present, it's scientifically studied, I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, but you're going to hear a lot about the endocannabinoid system because Texas is coming your way, it's already here, and it's just going to get uh, bigger uh, in Texas. Uh, the CD1 uh, receptors are found primarily in the central nervous system. And, you know, it's interesting because I was in San Diego a couple weeks ago, we had, I was speaking with some emergency room physicians from UC San Diego and Scripps Medical Center, and they were showing about some of the patients, they had pictures of patients being intubated uh, that were overdosed on marijuana, and I didn't understand that, and I'm still trying to figure out what the, what the physiology is behind that, because the CD1 receptors are not found in the, in the, in the, uh, the hypothalamus and the medulla, 
where you where you're gonna or the brain stem where you're gonna have things like over, overdose with heroin or other opioids or alcohol, um, the, the CB1 receptors aren't there. So I don't understand why these patients that they were seeing in the emergency department were requiring intubation. Um, and I, I still haven't figured that out. But that's the only thing we come up on their toxicology screen and their million dollar workup was about cannabis. Then I'll talk a little bit about the CB2 receptors are the ones that are found in the periphery more in tissues that modulate inflammation, like the, the, the uh, uh, spleen, etc. cetera. Um, brain and spinal cord, multiple, there's multiple neurotransmitter effects, and especially this is a centrally acting substance or component. It has a lot of interaction with 5-HT1A, with dopamine, and you know, that's when you start getting into the depression relationship, the schizophrenia, psychosis, etc. cetera. Um, but it can be found in the periphery as well. Uh, the CB2 receptor, again, inflammation, then reports on benefit with neuropathic pain or inflammation. You know, Marinol's been around since 1986, which is a synthetic THC, you know, originally designed for chemotherapy associated with caxia, hepatitis stimulation. And can anybody that's not a toxicologist or a chemist identify on this screen which one is the real deal, which one is a synthetic, and which one is CBD? Probably not. That's what they are right there. Uh, it looks very, very similar. So I'm going to focus a lot initially on pain because that's the world I live in, um, and, and I think it's, I'm just going to kind of get some of this out there so you guys can take away some information about why I got to where I am. But there's evidence that there is supraspinal anti nociception because the CB1 receptors are found in areas of the thalamus, the periaqueductal gray, dorsal midbrain. If you say something about the medulla, but I still doesn't, don't think that the concentrations from what I read are enough to to cause uh, respiratory suppression. And you get that disassociative effect with the, because there's a high concentration in the amygdala. Um, there's spinal antinociception. Uh, the dorsal horn, where there's suppression of the C fiber evoked responses. Uh, they have found these, uh, these receptors on pre and post synaptic sites. Dorsal ganglion is where they feel the uh, CD cannabinoid receptors being synthesized. Um, and they are found in primary efferent fibers of large myelinated containing fibers and small unmyelinated for the neurologist that's in the room. Remember this guy from the Olympics? He did the ball and he broke his leg. That's got to hurt. Um, this is a very important slide, for, especially for your primary care docs that are out there. Um, what are the most common reasons people go to the doctor? You know, you know, cough, cold, sinusitis, diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, those sorts of things. But in the top 20 diagnoses that present nationally that have anything to do with pain or lower back pain, knee pain, and abdominal pain, this is based on the National Ambulatory Care Survey uh, from 2014. I do not find any uh, current data uh, because but anyhow, the, the other things that are not found <laughs> in the top diagnoses are fibromyalgia, seizure, cancer. Those are not the things that people go to see the doctor for. But the ones that have um, any type of pain diagnosis are lower back pain, knee pain, abdominal pain. It's very important to remember. But the things that are most prescribed are analgesics. You know, we are in the midst of an opioid crisis and epidemic. Um, antidepressants, anxiolytics. There's a lot of patients that combine these types of theories, the therapies with opioids and benzodiazepines. Not a very good combination. And I feel pretty strongly about not combining opiates and cannabinoids at the same time because they both, uh, we don't know what the drug interactions can be. Um, Zach Miller, a couple weeks ago, did have this knee dislocation and I think he severed his top artery or something like that. He almost yeah. lost his leg. Oh. Uh, but he got yep. um, If you look at the literature on cannabis and pain, the one that most people refer to is the JAMA article that came out a couple of years ago by Penny White in the UK. Uh, they did a nice review, did a lot of my leg work for me, um, and they said, you know, we really don't know what the diagnoses are, we don't know what the efficacy is, so they did a nice systematic review of the literature and looking at benefits and potential adverse effects. And so they looked at chronic pain, and I hate that diagnosis because pain is a broad diagnosis. Um, Thirteen of these 28 studies were with the big smalls. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It's a naturally uh, created, not created, it's a, it's a natural product uh, that is purified, regulated, and GW Pharmaceuticals in, uh, in Vancouver, I think was their last time they were based there. It's a one-to-one -one natural THC to CBD ratio, uh, administered in a very controlled dose, uh, 
Uh, it's like a, not an inhaler, but it's a, it's a dispenser of aerosol spray. But that's not available in the U.S. We don't, we, we don't have those available here. So nearly half of the studies looked at things that aren't even available here. Um, they looked at several studies looked at synthetics, the nevolone, sesamet, marinol, which I discussed a little bit already. Uh, four studies looked at smoked THC, so a very small percentage looked at what people are using. Um, one looked at vaporized cannabis, and only one study looked at an edible. And of all the diagnoses that they were looking at, the vast majority were neuropathic type pain or cancer pain. And again, what were the most common reasons people go to the doctor? Is back pain, knee pain, and abdominal pain. So even this study did not show any evidence of benefit for common pain conditions. And they did find that several of them were high risk of bias, but their conclusion that there's moderate evidence to support the use of cannabinoids in the treatment of chronic pain. Uh, I had a very difficult time um, really understanding why, how they came to that conclusion. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big mountain biker, it's not me. <laughs> but again, a face plan off your mountain bike is going to hurt. Uh, earlier this year, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine came out with another review of, of cannabis on a variety of medical conditions, and I wanted to focus just on the pain. Uh, interestingly, you know, a lot of these authors were very well respected from very well respected institutions, but zero authors had any background in pain medicine or anesthesia. None of them. And they, they referred to the JAMA article as being the most comprehensive, the one I just reviewed. Uh, and they did say, yeah, neuropathy was probably the most common condition study, and the majority of the studies focus on abixamols, which we cannot get in the United States. Um, and they said only a handful of studies looked at cannabis that people are using in the United States. So kind of what I was mentioning earlier. Um, cannabis products don't, you know, that are sold in our markets, like in Colorado, uh, really don't have any resemblance of the things that are available for research, like the, the, the nabixamols that are purified and regulated. So they say, well, but we don't know about dosing, with administration, uh, etc. But they came to the same conclusion. <laughs> that cannabis substantial evidence, that cannabis is effective for the treatment of chronic pain in adults. And again, chronic pain is a huge diagnosis. You've got you know, somatic pain, visceral pain, neuropathic pain, and under each of those categories, maybe you have to treat of other diagnoses. And as we know, different types of pain will respond to different types of medication. You know, I don't use gabapentin for, um, you know, a compression fracture. You know, that's, that's not going to work. There's another nice, deep, neatest location. So the Annals of Internal Medicine came out with a article in August of this year, and I was kind of bummed out because it kind of stole my thunder because I was in the process of publishing my own article which ended up being published in Missouri Medicine uh, just last month, uh, kind of looking at the same, the same data that was out there in the medical literature, they reviewed it, and the Annals of Internal Medicine said, you know, okay, um, there's not evidence, you know, the, the things that are being used or the ones that have been studied aren't available. You know, we don't have the big smalls here. Um, I tried using a synthetic on a heart transplant patient with chronic sternal pain, but it was off-label use insurance shot me down. Um, CBD, the, the uh, neurologist, is there any pediatric neurologist in the room? Or pediatric epileptologists in the room? I know we have a hospitalist, we have a neurologist here. Um, but the CBD, you're going to hear a lot of information on in the press. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, with CBD is a pediatric seizure, you know, parents were nightmare, give these kids what they need. Um, but make sure what's on the label is what they're getting. Uh, and I don't know, I, don't, I didn't have it in my presentation, but uh, there was a pharmacist that looked uh, in JAMA earlier this week or last week, uh, went out in, in LA, San Francisco, and Seattle, and they purchased the, the CBD products. And I believe only 16% were correctly labeled. Some of those CBD products had no CBD in it, and some of those CBD products had a lot of THC in it. So it's mislabeling, um, you know, that, that goes to the lack of regulation. Uh, across the country in these states that have medical marijuana programs or legal programs. And they really don't know how CBD really works because it doesn't fit into the CB1 receptor, it doesn't really fit into the CB2 receptor, so they're not really sure on how CBD is working on these kids that have intractable seizures. And they look at very specific, you know, Dravet syndrome, you know, some very rare or uncommon uh, seizure disorders. 
you know, there's a, maybe an effect on the 5-HD1A receptor or dopamine, dopamine receptor. So they just really don't know. So the president of the American Epileptic um, uh, Society uh, wrote a letter to the Pennsylvania legislature. You know, because a lot of these products are artisanal. They're kind of made in um, not really in a laboratory setting. They're made in a, maybe a building. Where, and you have to use a lot of marijuana plants to boil down to a little bit of oil. And at the end of the day, these products are very expensive for patients. Um, but you have these, art these anecdotal reports of patients getting benefits. So, you know, let's do some of the, the research. And the problem, you know, according to the, the former president of the American Epileptology Society, or Epilepsy Society, said, you know, the, the people in Denver, this was a study at the um, uh, University of Colorado in Denver Children's Hospital, a lot of these kids are having, you know, paradoxical reactions, increased seizures, developmental regression. Some of these kids actually have to be put on a, on a ventilator. Again, I can't understand what the mechanism is. Uh, but some of them, you know, they need coma induction to have their seizures stop. You know, so, the, so these, the problem in Colorado, you have people like, um, I don't know where you want to say, like a, an internist or family practitioner making these recommendations, but it's not a prescription. Do not call it a prescription, it's a recommendation in Colorado. So people that don't have training in pediatrics, in neurology or pediatric epileptology are making these recommendations to these kids uh, without the appropriate training. So the ones that are trained are at the bedside at Children's Hospital in Denver having to manage um, these kids. Um, this, this study came out, uh, it was interesting because they, you know, there, there's evidence there that it might help with seizure disorder. I'm not going to negate that, but this study that came out at Children's Hospital showed that relocation in Colorado had an important role in, in response. You know, because the kids that were from Colorado had a lower response rate than the kids that moved from out of state to Colorado, fairly significantly. You know, because it's a subjective parental report. Well, I think my kids have less seizures, you know. But they're not using any biomarkers like EEG to really monitor are these kids getting any benefit. So, the response rate was similar to placebo, and again, they didn't use any biomarkers. Um, University of Alabama, Birmingham is doing a nice study looking at CBD uh, products in pediatric seizure. Uh, but what they're finding, and I think that the research that they're doing is good and is required and necessary, uh, but what they're finding is that a lot of these kids are on multiple anti-seizure medications, uh, and they are finding drug interactions that we didn't know about. Uh, they're, you know, it, it actually competes at the uh, cytochrome 3,4A, in the liver, so a lot of these kids on multiple seizure medications are starting to get um, higher levels and toxic levels of the other anti epileptics that they are on. So there's a lot of this stuff that we're starting to find out about seizures. Um, this is the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And we won't have time to talk about cardiovascular effects, cerebrovascular effects, pulmonary effects, psychiatric, neurologic, maternal, fetal, pregnancy, lactation, um, and at the end of the, my presentation, there's a link that you can take a picture of or whatever. I organized a conference last year from 8 to 5. Uh, we had addiction medicine, ER medicine, um, maternal fetal medicine, uh, DEA, law enforcement, school administration, school resource officer, and we still could not touch on everything. I mean, you can easily put a three-day conference on uh, regarding marijuana. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of foundation of what we have in Colorado, and I give the state some uh, credit for tracking this type of information because there are several states that are not tracking this information. Uh, I was at the Department of Revenue in Wyoming last year, and I met the guy who runs Washington's marijuana program. I go, how many medical marijuana patients do you have? He goes, I don't know. I go, how do you not know? He says, we don't. It's just a program, and people are free. Uh, to make doctors are free to make recommendations to whatever patients, so we're not tracking that. But they just around that time they were instituting a uh, patient tracking uh, program in the state of Washington. So again, um, in Colorado, you have to qualify with a disabling medical condition. You know, pain, uh, nausea, um, cancer. Uh, I have a list of them. But this is this is our state capital, and you saw a little video of the state capital on the 420 celebration, which is the, the, the national marijuana holiday that you hear about. 
Um, and Denver sometimes can get a little polluted, uh, but that little cloud is not the pollution in Denver, that's the marijuana haze in our civic park at the state capitol. And if you, you know, I blew this picture up, I said, I'd be very hard pressed to find anybody in this picture with a disabling medical condition. But that's what happens after you throw a big party in Denver City Park, and they actually are getting rid of it next year because it costs too much to clean up uh, the marijuana folks throwing a party in the city park. Um, I try to get more current data. They, they haven't updated it through October, but as of the end of September, we had 30 or 92,000 uh, valid medical marijuana patients. Um, most of them were men, because I think men may have a lower pain threshold than women. Um, <laughs> this is my personal opinion. Um, it's not the 20-year-old snowboarder that they, that's getting a medical marijuana card. I mean, the average age is 43-year-old male. And where I live in El Paso County, we have one-fifth of the entire state's medical marijuana patients live in the county that I live and practice in. So here's some of the severe pain, spasms, nausea, seizure, cancer. Obviously, it adds up to more than 100% because a lot of these patients have more than one diagnosis. So seizures, again, very important to do the research, but a very, very small percentage of the patients that are using it for medicinal purposes. I'm the only one that's been tracking this at the only time I the graph that I saw, and Mitch Morrissey, who was the state's VA, talked about, you know, we went from a very healthy state, but if you look at the registry, went to a very sick state in a very short period of time. And this is, this is all based on politics and maneuvers at the state level, and we had these, uh, what I would describe as de facto uh, legalization in 2009. We had all these dispensaries open up like, like daisies across the state. They're everywhere. And again, here's kind of the list of all the counties, and you know, I don't have a point, but in El Paso County, where I live, we have the most number of medical marijuana patients. And we have 134 medical marijuana dispensaries in El Paso County. And I'll show you a little bit later, we have more medical marijuana dispensaries in the state of Colorado than we have McDonald's and Starbucks combined. So a lot of eating. Of course, recreational marijuana is also Yes, and that's where I think some people get this information. When we passed Amendment 64, which legalized marijuana for recreational use, Colorado was a box, the state of Colorado. But as part of that amendment, every municipality within the state had the option of opting out of recreational marijuana. So where I live in Colorado Springs, which is within El Paso County, Colorado Springs opted out. We do not have recreational marijuana in Colorado Springs. Manager Springs, where my kids went to high school, was part of El Paso County, just on the outskirts of Colorado Springs. They do have two recreational stores in a town of 5,000 people. So, and we're, that's the only stop between Denver and Pueblo that you get legal marijuana, at least in the I-25 corridor where I live. So there, I think at the time that this passed, people were like, oh, Colorado's legal. Yes, but 72% 72 or 73% of the, all of the municipalities in the state opted out. So most said no. A lot of people don't know that. We have a lot of plant-based medicines. You know, we use them every day, in, in depending on what specialty you may be in. We have them. They, they've met the rigor of scientific study. They, they, they qualify as a medication by definition. I don't know why this has been different in, in Colorado and other states that have uh, recreational programs or medicinal programs. I talked to a few people earlier about normal. Anybody remember normal? Heard of normal? Some of those older people might remember normal. It's a national organization to reform marijuana laws. They've been around for many, many years. And the head of normal back in 1979 made it very clear what their agenda was going to be. We will use medical marijuana as a red herring to give marijuana a good name. And then we talk about pharmacists and what are called bud tenders. Has anybody heard of that term before, bud tender? That's the person behind the counter at the medical marijuana shop who is going to give you advice on what you should take for whatever ails you. And we know that pharmacists are very smart people and they have saved my butt many, many times. Drug interactions, etc. <coughs> They're smart people. They have good training, four years of uh, college, pharmacy school. They have to maintain certification. They have to 
go and get continuing education classes. But tender, as of yesterday, you have to be 21 years of age and have a pulse and experience with marijuana. No scientific required background or training is required. So what is a medicine? You know, we need to know the drug chemistry and reproduce it. We need safety studies. We need ef proven efficacy in well-controlled studies. And it has to be accepted by qualified experts, and evidence should be widely available. That's what a medicine is, in my, in my book. And again, we have a lot of those plant-based medicines that have met this rigor, uh, and, and it's accepted for those, you know, we have dispensary cannabis. It's really, it's a generic substance. It's not, you know, it's, it's, and it's across the board. And I'll get to the potencies in a little bit. Uh, but it's just a plant that's, you know, grown, dried, and supposed to be purified and regulated, seed to sale, um, supposedly. Um, but it, you know, it's different than what a cannabinoid is, which is actually extracted from the plant in a laboratory setting and is purified. There's no crap in it, there's no contaminants, there's no other things, which I'll get to in a little bit. There's a difference, and it's important that you understand. Cannabis and cannabinoids are different. Although cannabis has cannabinoids in it, there's other stuff in cannabis that may not have medical application. So a lot of these can cannabinoids, like Sativex, uh, Sesame, uh, I mean not Sesame, Sativex and Epidiolex have gone through the rigors of stringent testing. Um, you know, pain, again, as you know, has not been studied as carefully. And um, cannabinoid-based medications um, have been approved. We know how they dose it. You know, it's a little inhaler, not inhaler, a little meter dose squirt in your mouth. Um, and cannabis has no evidence-based guidelines for use. So here's a patient of mine who, ALS, she, she had a bad hand. She's, she's a former teacher, she taught my kids. Uh, she has uh, ALS. She also has, on top of that, cervical spinal myelopathy. So she has a lot of spasticity. And she's very active. She tries to golf. She tries to ride her bike. And I gave her my her medical marijuana card because, I mean, I, you know, in the terminally ill and dying, I, not an issue for me. I'm like, here you go. Right? She goes, I don't want THC. I go, why? She said, well, I'm a kid in the 60s and I had a really bad experience in college. She got paranoid, she had a panic attack, tachycardia, all this other stuff. She goes, I don't want THC. So she comes in with this product and if you look on the bottle, well, about a fifth of it is THC, but a bulk of it is this THCA that I talked about earlier. It's a kind of a pro drug. And you know what happens if you smoke it? You, it has to be heated. The THCA, which is part of the plant, you heat it with combustion, which is not a good delivery system in my opinion. And it decarboxylates the THC, and that's the psychoactive component. So here she is getting this product that has a lot of THCA, and I'm, you know, I, it was kind of new to me. And, and I do a lot of work with the University of Colorado Pharmacology Department. And I, I called this woman up there that I presented with before, and I said, THCA. This is kind of my thought of how how it works. Basically, she, she said, you're right, you know, it's a tincture, you put it under the tongue, it's absorbed, gets to the liver, gets what? It goes under decarboxylation in the liver and becomes DHC, which is exactly what she didn't want because the bud tender doesn't have any medical background. And she was mad because she goes, my Flexeril, which helps with my spasm, cost me four bucks a month, but this product here was $400 a month. Again, because you need a lot of plant material to get down to uh, a little bottle, one ounce of this oil. So here we go. Go to the Great American Beer Fest and then go to the store, medical or recreational. I mean, I've no, I don't know any other product out there that is considered both. You know, people might self-medicate with alcohol or what have you. But there are, if you, somebody can tell me there's something that's, that's approved and accepted being medical and recreational at the same time, legally, because I mean, people are doing stuff equally like heroin, growing opium, that's not legal. Uh, go and get a free eighth, medical only, uh, first time patient discount, 25% off, uh, Monday madness, so bring in 10% you know, off on Mondays. Um, so here's a, the, the Keith Kong joint. Uh, for 60 bucks you get half an ounce in one joint, which is about the equivalent of about 30 joints in one joint. It's a lot of weed. Uh, so you get free t-shirts, so you get 100% off. <coughs> so if I wear my OxyContin, sure. To the pharmacy, will they give me my hussy content? Probably not. Uh, this one from Colorado Springs. Renew your medical marijuana card today 
and we will help you schedule a doctor's appointment and reimburse you in medicine for the cost of your doctor's visit. It's a cash business. You know. um, by definition, this is medicine in Colorado. It's a gas mask, which you know tries to concentrate the smoke in your face so you can get higher. Um, this has been spotted in Colorado Springs. It's called the rig. Um, in dosing, this is the apple bomb. Um, you know, for me, this is just not medicine. You know, we have a lot of plant-based medications out there that have met the scientific rigor. Um, and has anybody heard of the cannabis? Now, I usually speak to people in Colorado, and I go, oh, yeah, you know, half the, the crowd hands go up. The cannabis is a column associated with the Denver Post that's everything about weed, everything about pot. Um, and of course, the industry is like, well, we don't want kids to see this stuff. But they have a, a column that are easily accessible to children and adolescents on marijuana. They talk about different strains and hybrids and, you know, what's good? Moonshine haze as a medication here. Uh, you have snozberry, you know, from Willy Wonka. Um, you know, again, we're, we're not, they're not targeting youth. But are they? Girl Scout cookies, marijuana review. So this is just one of the strain reviews. And there's hundreds of strains available. Because they're creating them on a daily or weekly basis. You know, one strain on this day is going to be completely different a month later. Um, you know, I, I had another patient who I did not give the medical marijuana part to, but had severe torticollis. You know, he came in like this. And he failed everything. PT, Botox, you know, everything. And he was using cannabis to help with the he intractable headaches that would wake him up in the middle of the night because of the impingement in the, the, the base of the skull. And he would he was mad and frustrated because he'd go to the dispensary and goes, I want that product. And the blood tender went, no, 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 come over here. We have this new stuff over here. He goes, no, I want that. And he, they, he was being pulled away from something that he felt worked for him in order to try these other things that are available. And that happens all the time. Um, Deadhead OG, I've never heard of that before, but this is, you know, the Denver Post is making recommendations, um, medical recommendations, and actually we, some of the people and organizations I work with, tried to call them out and, and ask them, say, give me the data that shows that Deadhead OG will, will help with stress, insomnia, depression, and pain. You know, we got no response, obviously. Uh, this, this, uh, this <coughs> slide speaks a lot. You know, because over time, we've really undergone something what's called social warming. Um, you know, and as the perception of harm decreases, uh, the use will increase. And I think this slide takes social warming to an extreme. And this actually is a slide that I was able to get and was able to use with permission uh, from Fremont County, which is about an hour south of me. And it was a police investigation that had nothing to do with marijuana. But in the course of the investigation, they went through this um, kind of storage unit. And when they were going through the storage unit, they found this gem of an infant uh, with a, somebody holding a fully loaded um, marijuana pipe to its face. So this one was in Texas, actually. I don't know if anybody's seen this slide before. Um, but with the social norming, you're going to get more of this. And this, this one is, is really bad. Um, because we haven't talked about, and we won't have time to talk about, pregnancy, lactation, maternal fetal medicine. You know, the transmission, you know, it, cannabis is lipid soluble, can be very highly concentrated in breast milk, although the studies on that were very, uh, were based on some very weird kind of studies, but they're trying to do a little more research. And now the, the science is coming out on the effect of the developing brain, you know, the synaptic connections are not getting there in those uh, you know, offspring of mothers that may be using cannabis. And they're finding that these kids, over time, when they hit middle school, are starting to develop behavioral problems. Imagine that. But this is just an illustration of why this has not been a good idea. So potency has become another issue, another problem, because you've got uh, cannabis, generic dispensary cannabis, and you have these concentrated hash oil. I don't know if anybody's heard about all the hash oil explosions that have occurred across the country in, in places they're trying to manufacture it on their own uh, because it's cheaper to do this, um, and then you run into some problems with the natural explosions where people have been killed, uh, maimed, injured, burned, etc. Uh, so, you know, the national, and this is two-year-old data, um, and you're going to hear, yes sir? Could you describe the difference between marijuana and hash? Well, there's a lot of different terms for marijuana and hash, 
and then you have hashed oil, you have hashish, you know, you have all these different terms. When I refer to it, it's, <coughs> marijuana to me is weed, pot, hash is kind of a stronger component of that, and then you have the hash oil, which is a concentrate, and it, it's turned into something called butter or shatter. Uh, that people will do that, which I'll get to in a little bit. Is hash the derivative of marijuana? It basically is marijuana because both of those have THC in it. But the hash oil is very, very concentrated. And you'll see an illustration here in a sec about that. Um, but you're going to hear over time, well, this isn't your grandpa's marijuana. This is not the marijuana of the 70s. This is not the marijuana of the 80s. And I can tell you the marijuana in 2017 is not the same marijuana as it was in 2014 in Colorado because they are creating these strains because they, they always say, well, we're never going to be able to get beyond, you know, 20% THC, you know, in the, in the bud flower that's smoked. But now they're reaching the 30%, 35% smoked bud flower, and now some of the concentrates, and they're proud of this, this is 99% THC. This is the crack of marijuana. This is not your grandpa's marijuana, where it was back in the 70s, about 2 to 4% THC, in the 80s, maybe four, six, seven percent. The 90s, where the addiction rates came out in the 90s, was about maybe seven to nine percent THC, where they, the, the addiction rates was like nine percent in the adult, 18 percent in the, in the adolescents. You know, why is there a difference between adolescents that might get addicted? I mean, their brains are still developing and growing. Um, you know, the parts of the brains that grow, grow first or mature first are the, you know, I need this, I want, you know, the, the excitement, the, and the need for speed and that sort of stuff. And the thing that develops last is the frontal consequences, those sorts of things. You know, that's why they think that there's a higher propensity for adolescents to become addicted than adults. And that's why some people are proposing in recreational states that the, the, the cutoff should be 25 years of age, not 21. So this high octane marijuana is what is putting the users in the hospital, not the seven. No, well, that's it's a really interesting point because no, because you have chronic users and naive users. Some people that you, some people that are naive, a very low percent THC can put them in the hospital, and that's why the whole driving impairment is in, in controversy now because the five nanograms per mL cutoff, which Colorado uses, is up for debate, and a lot of a lot of states are debating it because it's not like alcohol; it's a regulated like alcohol, but it doesn't work like alcohol. You know, even though the chronic alcohol can fool around with more than 0.08 in their system. Um, the, the response to THC is so broad and variable in different patients that people that get a low percent can end up in the hospital. And people don't go to the hospital, they're stoned. Uh, they, they go because they have a side effect or sequela related to their marijuana use. Um, and, and very heavy mental illness. You're going to see psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, panic attack, uh, those sorts of things. And there's a paper I published, which I'll get to a little bit and I'll tell a little bit more about that. So the national potencies are still below what Colorado has in terms of cannabis and hash oil. Um, there's, a, there's an organization in Pueblo, which is about 40 minutes south of where I live, called Posada. Uh, and they kind of are the intake for the homeless that are moving, because we have what I, I describe as marijuana refugees moving <coughs> from out of state. And it's interesting, because there's an ER physician down in Pueblo who's tracking a lot of this data, and a lot of these patients are moving from other states because Colorado had an expanded Medicaid program and the ones, the patients that they're seeing in the emergency department are coming from primarily the states that did not expand their Medicaid program. And, and Pueblo is a very affordable place to live. It's cheaper than Colorado Springs, much cheaper than Denver. So there's this influx of these patients or people and households moving to Pueblo because they want to get a piece of the action. You know, because of talk about the money, and they think it's going to be great, and then they arrive, and they don't realize, well, you have to be a resident in Colorado for a year before you can get part of the action. They're like, oh, crap, now, now what am I going to do? You know, now I'm homeless. And they'll show up with all sorts of things. Everything under, on their backs is what they have. So Ann Stottleman, who was the executive director, who was a little firecracker, she's about five foot tall, uh, the champion of the homeless. She's a wonderful, wonderful person. And, um, and she actually shut the Sada down this year. Reasons because she was um, her staff was being threatened over time. These people become much more violent. Uh, but she did an informal study, which was very interesting. In 2014, there was 236 households self-reported that the reason they moved to Pueblo was for legalized pot. And in 2015, that number went up a little bit 
the 273 households, and still, you know, they're not open on weekends. So the, at least one a day plus was moving to Pueblo um, for marijuana to the city of Pueblo. In 2016, that number went to 890 households said, we are here for the marijuana, shortly after legalization. And so if you look at this slide, it's, I hate these progressive lenses, I hate getting old. Um, but the, you know, this is a homeless camp. Um, the next person to wake me up at night might get shot in the face, the next military person. And Dr. Randall, who does a lot of ER work and homeless outreach that the, the homeless people are, it, it, she did disaster relief for the city of Detroit. She's a very, very smart, well-trained. She's boarded in ER medicine, pediatrics, and family medicine. Very, very smart lady. She, she's doing very good work in Pueblo. Uh, she said that it's turning into, you know, some of these homeless camps are to the point where they, they resemble refugee camps. You know, high risk of communicable diseases, you know, close quarters, you know, winter time, uh, etc. Children's Hospital, now this was an interesting study that came out a couple years ago uh, demonstrating the, there's actually an effect of secondhand smoke in these kids that are maybe exposed, they're not using uh, cannabis, uh, but they had a pretty significant increase in the percent of kids, 16%, uh, one in six kids that went, that were hospitalized for bronchiolitis tested positive for marijuana exposure. It's not zero. Um, you're talking about the hash oil explosions earlier. If you look at before legalization and then what happened once legalized marijuana happened, you know, again, these people are using it's butane, um, you know, lighter fluid, and that's how they, there's two different ways to extract um, hash oil, pardon me, from uh, cannabis is cold water extraction and hash oil extraction. Um, and when I was on the governor's task force, you know, I, I voted for put a limit on the amount of butane that's left in hash oil because it's just a public health issue. Inhaling uh, combusted butane just cannot be good for the body, for the pulmonary system, et cetera. And we were steamrolled by the industry. Right now, there is no limit of residual butane in hash oil in the state of Colorado that I'm aware of. So this guy, Wayne Winkler, he's uninsured, uh, blew himself up uh, doing hash oil, making hash oil uh, at his house. And, you know, he ended up in the ICU, burn treatment, cost a lot of money, he, he couldn't pay, nobody could pay uh, for his uh, care. Um, I actually published a paper a couple years ago, you know, because all the data I read comes out of Denver. You know, Denver this, Denver that. You know, it's kind of the redheaded stepchild of Colorado, it's Colorado Springs, the second largest city. So I said, what's happening in my community? And I'm not an emergency medicine physician, but I wanted to know what was happening. So I went through, uh, with the help of uh, this wonderful uh, nurse scientist, thank God for Rochelle, she was fantastic. Um, and I didn't realize, because I do, I'm in private practice, hospital billing is a freaking nightmare. Oh my God, you know, trying to match, and to me I'm a very simplistic type of person. Patient comes in on this day, give me a bill, put it together, very hard to do. Uh, but we looked at emergency room visits between 2009 and 2014, just on the cusp of legalization. And I want to know how much money did the hospital lose? Um, and I actually had the CFO of the hospital sign an attestation saying, this is the number we came up with. It was $20 million in lost healthcare dollars between 2009 and 14 at one hospital in Power Springs that does not have legal marijuana. Oh yeah, there's our disab disabling people in the um, Civic Park again. So you know, what, what kind of message are we getting across to our kids and adolescents and young adults here? Here's, the, here's another, I like the cannabis because it gives me a lot of ammo. Uh, so here's the asthma inhaler that mimics, or the, 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 um, the cannabis dispenser that mimics an asthma inhaler. So these kids are walking around schools, I can tell you, that are, the, the teachers have, they're more, they're more educated now, but these kids can do this stuff in school, it does not smell like marijuana, so they're not coming and reeking. Um, so they're really having a hard time determining is, is Johnny there because he's stoned or is he just having a bad day? You know, they have these things called jewels. I mean, you guys probably never heard of them. It's J-U-U-L-S. Um, those are the e-cigarettes that you can charge by putting in your USB port. Um, but they can be Jimmy Ray to smoke hash oil over lunch. And kids are using them in school. Here's the highlighters that they can use. You, they look like normal highlighters. You unscrew the bottom turns into a marijuana pipe, smoke it, clean it out, go back to school, put it in your front pocket, the teacher has no idea you're using it. Uh, they have bracelets that turn into vapor pens, hoodies that turn into vapors. 
Um, I got yelled at several years ago because I used this slide. This was in California. Uh, again, the messaging we're trying to put to, the, to our young adults. You know, you have the Pop-Tarts and the Pop-Tarts. They were taken off the shelves in California. I did my disclaimer on that. Uh, these are real products. The Ed Pure Swedish Dish medical products in Colorado. They look exactly like the ones you get out of the bag. Um, and they actually did a news story. They had put these products in front of kids and said, which one is medicine and which one is not? And obviously they couldn't tell the difference. Uh, the warheads and potheads, and we talk a little about youth use. Um, the Meyer study was very interesting. They followed kids from 13 to 38 over time. I think the, nun, the end was pretty good. It was over a thousand subjects. <clears throat> and they look at, you know, uh, neuropsychological decline, and when these kids stopped, as they get older, some did not recover. So it does support there may be actually a neurotoxic effect uh, on the brain. You know, there are some other studies, the Journal of Neuroscience uh, had a nice study looking at areas of the brain that actually uh, are smaller or shrunk compared to, in users compared to those that are non-users. And I, I think that if there were certain body parts that might shrink um, in other areas, that we may have less populators. Joking. <laughs> <laughs> So I mean, if you guys heard the Healthy Cubs survey in Colorado, the, the media gets a hold of this. It said our kids are fine; they're not using, but the, you know, the use rates are flat. Um, but the response is very interesting because Dr. Murray from the Hudson Institute in DC, who I work with a little bit, um, did a nice rebuttal on it. Uh, the response: they, they send this survey out to kids in high school. They said you use pot, you use alcohol, blah blah blah. They go through, and they, and they said that well, these kids aren't using because the response. You know, we're not seeing more responding that they're using marijuana. But the response rate was 46%, which is below CDC recommendations for a qualified study. They did not use El Paso County, where I live, which is the fastest growing county in the state. And they did not use Denver, I mean, uh, Douglas or Jefferson County, which are the largest school districts in the state. So the data was somewhat flawed, because we actually have um, the number one, we actually hit the number one spot of adolescent use according to the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. If you look at the slide, it's kind of busy. The green are the legal states as of 2015. The red are medical marijuana states, and the blues are the non-medical, non-recreational marijuana. As you can see, the youth use tends to shrink when you don't have the marijuana available. Um, ER visits are going up because, again, the, the three things that's boiled down to me public health and safety, adolescent use and addiction, driving impairment. Um, and, you know, what are the costs? You know, how much has it cost? I mean, I had my 20 million from one hospital in a short period of time. You know, what are the health care costs? You know, have we done a good job with tobacco? No. Alcohol? No. Opioids? No. What makes, what's going to make this any different than we, what we already know is a bad idea? I mean, if we had known about tobacco way back when, what do you think that we would have ended up in the situation where we were with all the, the health effects, et cetera? Probably not. Um, where are the kids getting from? Well, that's what you're getting from a friend or family member. These are the kids that are getting treated for uh, marijuana substance use um, addiction. I was in Puerto Rico before the last hurricane, uh, speaking to a group, and um, you know, we, were, we were talking about uh, you know the kids, the adolescent use, and you know why are these you know why do you think these kids are getting? Oh, I was getting prepared. And, Dr. Christian Thurston is a psychiatrist in Denver at the university who runs the Adolescent Substance Use Treatment Center. And I said, Christian, what percent of kids that you treat in Denver are there for cannabis use disorder? Because it's a real diagnosis, DSM-5, et cetera. And because kids do all sorts of things. They drink, they do heroin, amphetamine, cocaine, ecstasy, whatever. His response was 97% of the kids in Denver that are getting treated for substance use are there for cannabis use disorder. Um, American Academy of Pediatrics has a nice firm position opposing uh, marijuana use. Um, so these are the things that our uh, school resource officer found in our schools. A uh, little uh, Jimmy Briggs uh, highlighter. Uh, there's some other paraphernalia. And kids are done. They get, they get their, their marijuana and they go, oh, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever. It gets out on the internet and we can find it. The, the, the school resource officers and law enforcement find these pictures. A girl having a large bag of weed on her lap. There's the gas mask that's been found in the schools. Uh, they're creative. They use, you know, seashells and pieces of wood to turn into pipes. Um, this um, buckshot. Where is it? Here's the apple bomb. Uh, the buckshot 
is actually sold in the dispensary in order to not look like it's usable for marijuana. So this is actually one of the products that's out there that's being found in our schools. Uh, here's a girl getting high and drunk at lunch. Um, this is a study you don't want to really follow up on. You know, what's the toxicology in the kids that are, have completed suicide in the state of Colorado? Um, 10 to 19 years old. So the antidepressants, opioids, cocaine, alcohol, marijuana. Um, and the, the substances that are found most frequently in completed suicide in adolescents is marijuana. And uh, Paula Riggs is an adolescent psychiatrist in Denver. I asked her, what, what, why, why are kids being sh found with marijuana in their system more than other stuff? And her theory, which makes sense, is that marijuana is an anti-emetic. So you ingest other stuff that might make you throw up. Well, you want to suppress that reflex so you're able to keep the stuff inside of you so you do complete the suicide. Um, ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, has a nice position on it. American Psychiatric Association, there are DSM-5 uh, diagnoses that are available. Uh, and I won't get, I don't have time to get into the, um, the uh, sick with vomiting, you know, because the ER physicians that I uh, have done some work with, uh, they talk about, any ER docs here? No? Um, the, the term that I heard recently was scrometing, screaming and vomiting at the same time. These, these kids are like really hurling and they come in, why are you using marijuana? Well, it's for my nausea. When they go out, they say, don't use it because it can cause you know, sick vomiting or, or um, cannabis emesis syndrome, um, but they come back to the ER. Uh, PTSD, a nice study from Yale, shows worse outcomes in those that are using for PTSD because you have the vets, um, you know, the VAs in this debate of whether or not they should allow for medicinal use, I think it's gonna be a bad idea. Um, Gateway Theory, nice paper came out a few years ago uh, on supporting that kids that are using cannabis tend to progress to other things. I mean, not every pot smoker is going to become a heroin addict. You know, the, the percentage is probably fairly low. But the number of heroin addicts, um, booze and pot were somewhere along their progression into heroin. And I'm not an addiction specialist or counselor, but I can tell you by speaking for the past eight years on this, I have met more families that have had their, their, their uh, parents in particular have their families destroyed and torn, torn apart uh, because of addiction. Uh, they've lost a family or loved one or child uh, to addiction, not necessarily to marijuana, although that's a big one, uh, but to other drugs because they tend to progress uh, to harder drugs. Um, so here we talked a little bit earlier about the, you know, well, Colorado's making a lot of money, right? You know, $240 million last year, but if you look at the general fund, it's about 0.7% the entire general fund, but then our governor proposed a $500 million cut to hospitals, uh, road funding, taxpayer refund, increasing state tuition, cuts to, uh, to school districts, and they're getting cut all the time. Uh, so here's our medical marijuana dispensaries, there are pharmacies in the state, liquor stores, you know, we've got a lot of those too. There's a McDonald's Starbucks comparison. Um, and you look at the medical marijuana dispensaries and, and the recreational ones on top of that. Uh, so, can't throw a stick in Colorado without hitting some sort of pot shop. Um, I like how the, the cannabis again gives me more ammo. How to smuggle drugs out of DIA. You know, so when you're going through TSA, how do you get it through? And I like this little comment this guy has. I ate two full brownies on the shuttle from the car rental to the terminal. It's a lot. You know, the dose is about 10 milligrams, which is completely made up. Um, and in a brownie, there's probably six doses. 60 milligrams, this guy eats two of them, so 120 milligrams or, or 12 doses. Um, I do not recommend anyone do this. It hit me while going through TSA, and I became so baked. It was a good thing. I was traveling with someone to help me to the gate. <laughs> and then this other guy follows up. I want a story about how flight crew members can smuggle pot into the cockpit for use during <laughs> the cruise portion of the flight. <laughs> I mean, it really gets... Uh, ridiculous level. We talked a little bit about hash oil earlier. Um, you know, an ounce is an ounce is an ounce in Colorado. Legally, I can walk around with an ounce of weed in my pocket. You know, an ounce of dispensary cannabis, I'd be like this big ball in my pants. But if I had an ounce of hash oil, that could fit nice and discreetly in my, in my pocket, back pocket, side pocket, but it's the equivalent of 2,800 doses. This stuff is really, really strong. And that's why we're seeing a lot an explosion of people coming to the emergency department across the state with psychosis, schizophrenia, anxiety, panic attack. You know, with the study that I did, we looked, you know, because 
There were weaknesses in the study because of the urine drug screens, you know, it doesn't tell you acuity, but we did chart reviews, and I couldn't go through 4,000 charts by myself with one of the nurse, but we did random chart reviews, and acuity was well documented. Um, but you look at one ounce of hash oil, 2,800 servings. I had a patient who was, you know, I, I have a bag of anecdotes which does not make good science, I, I understand that, but I, I had a marijuana grower come in, he's back, he had back pain. I said, well tell me, what do you do? Because well, I grow marijuana. I go, what's that about? He goes, well, I gotta bend down, I gotta do it repetitively, my back hurts. And I go, what are you using this? So I use, I use marijuana. So how much do you use? Five grams a day. 5,000 milligrams of cannabis a day. And he was using it, he was smoking it, vaping it, eating it, dabbing it, uh, rubbing it, in all variety of forms. And I said, does it help for your back pain? And he laughed at me and he said, no, I just like to get hot. I mean, he was brutally honest, but I think he would have been the poster child for music cannabis and pain. Um, I like this one, I only put this in here because they're saying, well, we're, Colorado's ready to allow PTSD, PTSD to be treated for, um, as a qualifier, disabling medical condition, followed by 14 people arrested for a large pot grow found in Western Colorado. Um, there are doctors getting in trouble in Colorado for extended plant counts. I mean, when I went to medical school, they didn't teach me about cannabis, they didn't teach me like, one plant is better than 10, or 10 is better than one, or in Colorado now, there's a line, they just changed this. Previously, there was a line that I could make a recommendation for 99 plants for whatever disabling medical condition this patient may have. I have no training in that. Nobody that I know in the medical profession has training in 99 plants versus, now they said 12 plant, plant limit, limit. But I can tell you, in law enforcement that I work with, 12 or 99 does not equal 12 or 99. They don't know how to do math in Colorado. 99 typically about turns into 300. Um, black market is hiding in plain sight. This was a recommendation that a physician made in Colorado for a patient that has already been dead for several months. That is 99 plants equal 475 plants. You know, he had lived in a single white trailer, rent was 1500 bucks a month, but his electric bill was 7000 dollars a month. And you would think, the utility company would be working together with the law enforcement and say, hey, this double Y is really going off the grid here. Utilities don't care. They're making money. 7,000 bucks a month? Why would they want to say anything? Contaminants. Uh, UC Davis, last year, um, patient was getting undergoing chemotherapy, severely immunocompromised, um, unable to fight infection, opted for his medical marijuana product, contaminated with fungus, guess what? He contracted the fungus and he died. Not from his cancer, but from his marijuana. Uh, this came out two weeks ago. In Colorado, there was a public health uh, announcement with the, um, the Colorado Department of Revenue, Colorado Department of Agriculture, CDPHE, uh, saying some of these re medical and recreational products might have uh, pesticides on them, because they're supposed to test for pesticides, fungicides, rodenticides, these are killed rodents. Um, and they said it has a public health warning just two weeks ago. And these are the ones that I, I kind of highlight that I like. Fruity pebbles, you know, it's, we're not marketing the kids though, right? Remember that, they don't market the kids. Chewbacca, nightmare cookie, <laughs> that just can't be good. And my favorite, Tweety Tang. Yeah, Tweety Tang. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about cannabis and opioids. You know, again, I'm a pain, pain medicine physician. Uh, I, I deal with this every day. I, I work with the Colorado Medical, um, Colorado Pain Society. Uh, we're trying to get you know legislation for insurance companies to allow tamper-resistant, tamper-proof products available to patients are using. Um, but there's been a couple papers saying, well, uh, states that have medical marijuana laws might have less opioid prescriptions or less um, Medicare costs associated with less prescriptions. But the CDC came out and said Colorado drug overdoses are up in almost every county and ahead of the national average. Um, adult illicit cannabis use, cannabis use disorder in states with medical marijuana laws, going all the way back to 1991. So the, the, the end of the day, cannabis use and cannabis use disorders increase significantly more in states that have passed medical marijuana laws than those that did not. Um, this paper just came out uh, recently saying, well, um, they did another review looking at opioid use in marijuana states. But you know, the, the public is getting the eyes and the attention of the opioid epidemic. You know, they're, they're trying to hang it all on the use of cannabis. 
Well, people that have states have cannabis, well, they're not using it as many people. Well, wait a minute. We have an expanded use of the uh, prescription drug monitoring program. Doctors may be a little more reluctant to prescribe in the face of an opioid epidemic. We now have a widespread use of Narcan, because now they're training the library and the Democratic Public Library how to use Narcan in the aisles, because that's where the heroin addicts are shooting up, because they're getting smarter. They're more likely to live from their overdose than die. Um, and now patients are informed. I mean, you know, I have patients that, you know, we talk about their pain and we talk about their medications. And I think, really, you know, I really don't want to use an opioid. This is kind of a new thing I haven't really seen. Normally they would go, oh, give me, give me. You know, I, I, I'm referral dependent, so I usually get these patients that are already on high doses and I have to struggle trying to get them down to more reasonable doses or preferably off their opioids. Um, so look at Colorado drug overdoses. You know, there are more people died in Colorado from drug overdoses than car accidents in 2016. And if you look at the opioids, because um, this other paper, this paper came out that it showed the graph, it kind of went up, and then dropped down. They, were, they weren't looking at the entire data, and I actually contacted the author. I said, if you look at opioids overall, not just prescription opioids, because people tend to misuse their opioids or progress to heroin, if you look at, if you look at any, all the opioids together, there has not been a drop. And if you look at halfway through 2017, Colorado's on the, on the pace to have a record year of, drug opi uh, of opioid overdose deaths. Um, this paper came out, they surveyed, you know, nice number, 43,000 to start, follow up with 34,000. Um, cannabis use increases rather than decreases non-prescription opioid use and opioid use disorder. Um, heroin deaths is a nice graphic, went up 750%. That's a lot, that's a huge percent increase over 15 years. Um, let's see. Crime. I posted this slide before they changed it because the author had no clue where Colorado was on a map. <laughs> Does anybody know what's wrong with this picture? Colorado was the great state below Wyoming that is highlighted. <laughs> but they fixed it, but I was able to get the screen grab before. Uh, so we have, they're, they're mailing it, they're driving it across um, uh, state lines, they're sex trafficking. This is an FBI report from a couple years ago. They had, World Cannabis Week was in Denver in 2016 last year. They recovered five, ch five children, nine adults for trafficking, prostitution, uh, increased number of online escort services. I mean, the ripple effect uh, with marijuana is not just weed anymore. Human trafficking with you know nearly 10,000 pounds of marijuana, uh, and the, the environmental impact, which I want to kind of really get into. I, I post these slides from the DEA with the, long, the undercover folks that presented at my conference. My wife hates when I set up the Christmas tree um, because I'm not very good with electricity, you know? So, but I know, if you look at the slide on the left, that's a, that's a house that has altered electrical system in it. Those are all wires going everywhere. Um, so here's altered electrical, altered electrical wiring, um, you know, that you have first responder hazards. I mean, the house is on fire, you're trying to find grandma, you have wires all over the ground, you know, you don't know where you're going, it's smoky, uh, so the first responders are being put at risk. Um, these are commercial grade uh, lights that are being found in residential houses all across the state. Um, do it yourself ventilation, you're poking holes in these rentals. They're renting the houses, they, they'll pay the owner more money. Uh, to rent the house because they admit we're going to grow marijuana, so we'll pay you another five grand a month. Is that okay? And they're fine. And then they poke holes in it, they get molds in the, in the, in the walls. It's, drywall's not a good medium to grow crops. Uh, 22,000 pounds, found in a bus last year. Again, these are, these are not orchids in the window. These are huge. They're trees. They're little trees. Uh, you know, illegal grove just uh, down the street from an elementary school earlier this year. You know, these people have to wear hazmat suits. You know, why, why, if it's such a benign plant, why are they wearing hazmat suits to clean it up? So this is a very interesting, so how much does a home grow generate? How much do you make? So you have six people come out, move to Colorado from another state, they all go to the doctor at the time where you get 99 plants on their medical marijuana recommendation, and it's legal now, so they grow six more. <coughs> right? So they legally can grow 630 plants. Um, so if they have average growing skills, because apparently a lot of hot shots out there that can grow marijuana, uh, very green thumbs. This group of six people can create 2,500 pounds of marijuana in a year. Um, if they sold it 
per pound, they can make five million, but if they, they take it out of state to New York, they can make 10 million. So follow the money. Um, a plan, and I try to verify this, because I, I do have connections, and I know folks in the industry, I ask them, you know, is this, is this valid? Is this a real number? And they said, yeah. This is. So one plan can produce between eight and 16 ounces uh, if, if harvest a product. Um, indoor growth cycle, about 12 to 15 meats. So one ounce is about 60 joints. So at the end of the day, your 99 plants can generate 190,000 joints a year. I don't know anybody that, and that boils down to one joint every three minutes for a year. I did the math. I don't know anybody, so where's it going? It's going to the kids, it's being sold out of state, black market is alive and well in Colorado. Uh, you heard Mitch Morrissey earlier in the video. Um, you know, crime is going up, uh, black market is alive and well. Uh, they're not getting anything from the state, especially the school districts, uh, Denver Public Schools, you know, because they say, well, we can give it back to the schools, but no, they didn't. Violence is up. This is, you can go in the video and look at the violence happening in the 16th Street Mall, downtown Denver. So the homeless guy went crazy on a bunch of tourists with a PVC pipe. Um, crime's going up. Corruption. This is interesting. It was uh, the, the people that were originally hired and paid to run Colorado's Medical Marijuana Enforcement Division jumped ship, and they were supposed to have a one year cooling off window. But within six months, they joined the industry and set up a shop and had not one legal sale. It was all up to that door. So they got, they got busted for that one. Uh, Berkeley, you see Berkeley guy, former chair of Berkeley Cannabis Commission, uh, pleaded guilty to money laundering. Uh, driving impairment, I know we're getting short on time, I'm gonna try to fly through these, so I apologize. Uh, driving impairment, an economist wrote uh, an article several years ago, but what, is it, what does it cost for one driving fatality? You know, back then it was about 1.3 million dollars. We're talking about uh, life insurance, indemnity, um, you know, pain and suffering, etc. About 1.3 million dollars, 1.4 uh, per fatality. I heard more recent data says six. I don't believe it. I would go more conservative with 1.4 million per fatality. But the traffic deaths last year we had our record year uh, since going back to 2006. So over 10 years we had the most driving fatalities in the state of Colorado. So if you look at 608, 608 million ish, give or take. And how much did the state make last year? 240 million. We're already upside down on this, just on this alone. Uh, so here's a nice little percentage. So the people that are dying, one fifth, are related to marijuana. It's gone up every single year for the past 10, 11 years. You know, back in 2006, six percent. 2016, 20 um, percent. You know, different combinations. Again, I, I talked, you know, using opioids and benzodiazepines is not a good idea. Using alcohol and cannabis is not a good idea. I mean, it's reaction time, those sorts of things. So you, 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 you're going to get a wreck and kill somebody or hurt somebody or maim somebody. Um, when I was in San Diego, San Diego, a gentleman from UCSD was very interesting. He has a driving simulator, and he was, he was putting these people through, um, you know, having them smoke some marijuana, put them in a simulator, see how they do on the road, and they don't do so hot. And they try to develop real world situations. They have, and they should, he showed the video, it was pretty cool. The guy driving down the road and he's trying to make a left hand turn, and cars are coming. And he said all the subjects would just sit there and not make the left hand turn. So they got their computer person out and they had a car come up behind them. Right? They still would sit there and not make the left hand turn. Then they had the computer guy say, add a horn. So they had somebody honking on the horn behind them, trying to force them to make the left hand turn. It's very interesting. Um, drug driving goes, eclipses drunk driving. Um, this is a national data from um, the GHSA. Uh, it's the most common drug found in drug crashes. Um, it goes up in Utah, the bordering state of Colorado. Driving fatalities went up. Washington, uh, fatal crashes doubled after legalization. Uh, this is Pueblo. You know, they're, they're the homeless are very honest about why they are there. There's an homeless guy outside of Walmart saying, hey, spare some weed. You know, it's not a secret anymore. Um, medical mar I'm getting to the end here. Medical marijuana patients in Colorado cannot own their own med um, dispensaries. Uh, they can't test their product. So even though you may have your 99 plants or 12 plants, you can't test it to see, well, how much THC or CBD is in my plant? You're not allowed to do that. So they can't test for products or potency, and then the state is losing out on that revenue tax money. Um, there's no requirements for testing medical products for rodenticides, pesticides, fungicides, etc. Uh, no limits on potency. We talked about you know the 17% bud. 
compared to the 99% concentrate. You know, if you want to do some research on marijuana, you have to go through National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, NIDA, uh, DEA, you have to apply for a grant. You get your University of Mississippi is the only place in the you can do this. They grow medical grade marijuana at the University of Mississippi. It's like a Fort Knox, they got the barbed wire around there. They want their product, you know, protected. Um, and one of the studies that we, uh, we approved, uh, which is a PTSD study uh, that Johns Hopkins was involved with, Johns Hopkins is a smart institution. They got their Mississippi weed for testing for PTSD, and they said, well, let's test it, because it, it's labeled. It comes with, you know, seed to sale, it's 5%. So they tested it, it wasn't 5%. It's 8%, it's 4%, 6%. That's a part of studying the crop that makes it difficult. But if you had an isolated cannabinoid, much better to study. Um, this is the, the uh, conference that I organized last year. Uh, if you want to go, the, some of the slides, the videos for the presenters were on there. Um, we're happy to share that link with you guys. Um, the call memo, anybody familiar with that? 2013. You, you, probably, you probably are aware of the gist of it. Basically, the inter uh, Deputy Attorney General came out saying, we will leave those states alone that have marijuana programs if these eight things don't happen. Uh, distribution of minors, uh, criminal gangs, cartels, diversion from other states. At the end of the day, all of these things are happening. That's why there's a push for uh, Jeff Sessions to kind of put the uh, kibosh on states that have marijuana programs. Um, you know, we talk about a lot of data, statistics, I'm going to wrap it up with some of the actual people that have been involved. Uh, you have this 18-year-old kid uh, from Colorado, uh, marijuana intoxication was on his death certificate. Uh, he self-inflicted stab wounds. I think two went through his heart, um, and the only thing on his toxicology was a THC level of 38 ngs per ml, which was the active component, uh, not the not the um, inactive component. Everything else was negative. Uh, Levi Tombo is a gentleman who was not from Colorado, in school in Wyoming. Came down for spring break after legalization, so he's not a resident of Colorado. He's a minor. Got a hold of a medical marijuana product. Uh, edible, uh, became psychotic and jumped out the window and died. Uh, because you're going to hear a lot about psychoses with these strong, uh, potent products. Uh, Andy Zorn uh, committed suicide. He actually went to high school in El Paso County, uh, where I live, in Colorado Springs. Uh, in his suicide note to his mother, he wrote, My soul is dead, marijuana took my soul and ruined my brain. Uh, Christine Kirk uh, was a woman who was on 911 with um, now, the law enforcement uh, saying that her husband had got a hold of some edibles and become psychotic, and while she was on the phone with 911, was shot in the head by her husband and killed in front of her children. Um, this kid was run over by another kid who was stoned. Uh, Luke Goodman was in Colorado vacationing, uh, has no psychiatric history, got a hold of some edible products, and then shot himself in the head while his family was out at dinner. Um, this, I don't know if anybody heard of this one. The Planned Parenthood shooter got a lot more media attention but about two weeks prior to that, two to three weeks, the Colorado Springs Halloween shooter. Uh, this is one of the victims. Uh, was a former Iraq veteran who's running. This guy's becoming psychotic. He's walking down downtown Colorado Springs with a semi-automatic rifle, and this military guy says, hey, you, you shouldn't really be having that flashing around. He was shot five times and killed. The guy walks down um, the street, shoots Jennifer and Christine, who are sitting on their porch. Um, and then I got a hold of this toxicology report. There's only one thing on the system, is marijuana. Um, Planned Parenthood guy, his girlfriend was there. She had a medical marijuana card. And I can tell you, boots on the ground. My medical marijuana, patients that come into me that have a medical marijuana card, freely share. They share their medicine with their spouses, their loved ones, their friends, or they come in and say, my girlfriend has a card, I don't need that. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. Can't share your medicine, even if it was the monster cell, I don't want to share it. Um, you know, so they, they do, they freely share, they get it for their kids, they get it for their kids, they self diagnose and treat their kids with ADHD, etc. Um, it's a nightmare. Um, so this, this woman was uh, a good Samaritan who a bicycle fell off a car on I 25 in downtown Denver. She gets out, helps the person get the bike back on the car. She gets back in and was rear ended by a stone driver, and she was killed. Uh, this little girl was run over by a stone driver last year on her way home from the end of school party. Uh, this one I just put in there because, you know, operating a vehicle, a boat, a uh, plane while under the influence is just not a good idea. And so this flight instructor killed his student and himself 
uh, because he was he had I think uh, 30.1 NGs per ml um, in the system. I won't go through my case report, but I'm just going to uh, summarize. Um, you know, cannabinoids may have therapeutic benefit in some pain conditions, most notably cancer pain uh, or neuropathic pain, um, and better studies with synthetics or with products not available, not with what everybody's using. Um, and there's not a lot of research to support cannabinoid use in common pain conditions. And so with social norming um, and more acceptance comes more use, and with more use we're going to see more problems. And I think that the societal effects are going well beyond what would be considered responsible use or a marijuana as medicine. Um, so we do need the studies. I believe in the research of why I'm on the Medical Marijuana Scientific Advisory Council. Uh, I believe in evidence-based medicine. I think we really need to have products that might be available for our patients for certain conditions uh, that have been proven, not just a free-for-all, which is a big in Colorado. Um, thank you.